Hello and welcome to the third episode in our video series, Gender Matters. Janice Fiamengo was, until her recent retirement, a professor of English at the University of Ottawa. During the later years of her, of her academic career, she was one of a tiny minority of academics who publicly challenged feminism and, feminism and feminists. She's perhaps best known in the men's rights movement, movement for her video series, The Fiamengo File, produced by Steve Brule. The series started in 2015 with a video titled, Why I Am an Anti-Feminist. Now that was a hell of a good title to introduce a new <laughs> video series, I thought. And the episode is well worth catching as an, as an introduction to Janice's thinking, and we'll put a link in the video description. The series has now run to, I think it's 118 episodes, uh, Janice, and uh, yes. the, 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 the latest uh, on feminist lies about, um, about domestic violence. I've watched every episode in the series, so I can say with confidence that the quality level never falters. Janice is also one of three contributors to Regarding Men, an excellent, an excellent weekly video series, including Paulie Lamb and Tom Golden. Janice was a speaker at a number of the international conferences on men's issues, including the two we hosted in London in 2016 and 18, and she was a keynote speaker at last year's conference in Chicago. Her talks are always very well received. Janice, good evening, and thank you for joining us for the third episode of, of Gender Matters. Elizabeth and I are both huge admirers of your work, as are countless people around the world with an, with an interest in gender matters, including men's rights and feminism. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show. It's my pleasure to be able to say my bit about feminism and men's issues. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to start with the questions? Sure. So, Janice, my favourite of your articles is Is Feminism a Religion?, which can be found at Anti-Feminist Praxis, alongside some excellent posts, including leaflets to print and distribute, written by authors such as Karen Strawn audience. So go and have a look and download them and print them out and spread them. Uh, but in the article, Is Feminism and Religion?, you make an excellent case for feminism indeed bearing all the hallmarks of a secular religion, with an origin story, a fall from grace, and a utopian vision for redemption. And you talk about feminist ideas that women, whatever they are, bring special gifts to the world that men don't possess, and that ultimately, women are more moral than men. The irony in this position, which is empirically unjustified, is that, it seems to me, by suggesting that women simply are moral, it actually fails to hold women to moral standards. When you think about how it's used to justify increasingly disparate and lenient treatment of women in the criminal justice system, for example, I suspect that in some ways the idea that women are more moral than men may actually be encouraging immoral behavior by women. And to bring us back to academia, this, um, at this point, feminist academia's main activities in institutions seem to be censorship of dissent and lobbying for privileges for women, both of which are immoral by any reasonable standard. So I wonder whether you agree with me that feminism has a net negative impact on levels of morality in women, and if so, whether you think the situation is so. Well, that is an excellent question. I mean, we could spend our whole 45 minutes or whatever we've got now uh, just on that, I think. Uh, I would add to your list of immoral activities of academics uh, telling outright untruths about our society uh, and societies yeah, around right. the world, uh, yeah. you know, and uh, um, and also, of course, um, exacerbating the indifference towards and the active hatred of one half of the human race, which is also 
undeniably part of the feminist project in academia. I mean, we need look no further than the, uh, the article in the Washington Post called Why Can't We Hate Men, <laughs> written by a professor of sociology mm -hmm. and women's studies, uh, Professor Susanna Walters at Northeastern University. And I could list off, of course, a very long list of similar types of articles outright stating feminist desire to hate men and to encourage others to do so and to spread that hatred. So though, yes, the, the level of immorality in academia is um, undeniable, I think. And uh, yeah, it's a, it is, doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that if you tell people that they can do no wrong and that merely by getting up in the morning, they're proving their great courage and, and, you know, by making accusations, for example, by marching in women's marches, uh, carrying placards, shouting out obscenities about men, uh, calling on violence against the leaders of, of countries they don't like, uh, using crude obscenities, um, exposing or, you, you know, create crafting genitalia shaped items as, as some kind of bold statement of uh, female sexual power. <laughs> Uh, if you imagine that any of those things prove moral virtue, of course, what you're doing is encouraging the exact opposite. And it is interesting, I think, that the idea of female moral superiority was there at the very beginning of the women's movement, uh, at least in the 19th century, depending on, of course, where one places that beginning. But, um, you know, all sorts of suffrage leaders in the 1870s and 1880s claimed that women should have the right to vote and be involved in public life because they brought a superior morality, a greater concern for the weak, especially for children, you know, a concern for family life. Carrie Chapman Catt, an American suffrage leader, um, you know, made that statement over and over again, that if she didn't believe that this was a cause for the purifying of the human race, she wouldn't have been involved in it. Nellie McClung, a famous Canadian maybe the most famous Canadian suffragist said the same kind of thing over and over again, that it was women's greater morality that would clean up politics. Um, certain, certainly if we look back at the writings of Ernest Belfort Bax, the British barrister and philosopher, uh, you know, he talks about this idea that was prevalent in society that women uh, brought moral purification to society, even as, as he pointed out, there was this incredible leniency, even then, back in the late 19th century, uh, in, in um, treatment of women for various crimes ranging from petty theft right up to murder. I mean, that is such a fascinating book. For anybody who doesn't know it. I didn't know it up until fairly recently. It was Lucian uh, Valsen, uh, the Romanian uh, men's rights activist, who, who told me about it. <laughs> Terrible that I didn't know, and then I didn't read it right away, but um, I just read it about a year ago, and it, it blows your head right off. It's, um, it, it's the fraud of feminism. The fraud of feminism. It's the fraud of feminism. Yes, and yes. That was, that was yeah. 107 That's years ago that was published. That was 107 years ago, and he had written on the same topic many essays in the late 19th century. Uh, mm -hmm. That wasn't his first foray into the, the sphere of writing about feminism. And, you know, he makes that point that to convict a woman of murder, even back then in the late 19th century, one required a great deal more evidence um, than would be needed to hang a man, as he said, and that very few women, even once convicted, he said usually they were convicted of a lesser crime, manslaughter. Uh, very few women, even convicted of murder, uh, received capital punishment. And uh, in cases where women murdered their husbands, all they had to say was that they had been abused by those husbands and uh, they were usually, uh, usually let off or given a lighter uh, charge or sentence rather and and uh, you know that was never a, a, a plea that could be used on the part of a man who had murdered his wife we know that that has continued right up until the present day Sonia Starr's research she's a law professor at the University of Michigan she's talked about the uh, prison sentencing gap as well uh, I think it's 63 percent she found um, in favor of women for similar crimes and that's 
and that's already at the point where the woman has been actually convicted and sentenced, but she found that women were something like twice as li likely as men to have a plea bargain, twice as likely to avoid incarceration altogether, uh, far more likely or far less likely to be uh, arrested at all, far less likely to be charged, you know, far less likely to be found guilty and, you know, all of those. So yeah, it's quite, it's quite something when one starts looking into it. Obviously, if women are really more moral, one would expect that they might be held to a higher <laughs> moral standard. Um, but So we have that assertion, but at the same time, we have academics and many others telling us that women are never really responsible for any of their actions. They, we don't even think they ha have moral choices to make in many cases that is denied. And so what that means is that we have created a situation in which women never have to take responsibility for any bad action. What a, what a, what a thing to do, and, you know, how could that not create a moral hazard if you know that you can get away with any bad action and then simply claim that you are a victim and therefore not responsible for it and it works and there are the movements all across the United States and certainly in the UK to keep women out of prison for what any whatever crime, if it can be shown in any way that this woman was abused as a child or that she was in any way provoked or instigated to her crime or by a male partner. Even if she claims it, Janice, that's enough. All she has to do is claim it. We had a case in Canada, Nicole, um, Nicole Doucette, her name was, this is a number of years ago now, it worked its way through the, the criminal court, who hired a hitman mm. to, to kill her husband. Uh, she got off um, in the trial by claiming duress, uh, you know, that he abused her. There was no evidence that he had ever abused her. She claimed yeah. she'd phoned the RCMP many, many times and they failed to help her. In fact, when someone finally investigated that claim, it was found to be basically groundless. She had phoned them, I think, once and they had investigated and found nothing. Uh, so she was let off. The case was appealed right up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court came out with a decision that, in fact, the crime of duress did not apply in her case because she wasn't even living with her husband at the time that she hired this hitman to kill him. She didn't realize that the hitman was actually an RCMP officer. Um, so, you know, there was no doubt that she had tried to have him killed and would have had him killed. She wasn't living with him. She certainly, she told the RCMP officer that he was, you know, she never said he was abusive or anything like that. She just wanted to get rid of him. And yet the Supreme Court still decided that she had suffered enough and that she shouldn't be retried, even though there was no evidence she'd ever suffered at all. It's, it's so, quite, I mean, so yeah, I it's... Say, Janice, I, know, I know you admire William Collins's book, The Empathy Gap. Mm -hmm. And he, he, um, he has a lot to, well, on all these things, but... The, the 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 statistic that just you know that that just makes people's jaws jaws drop is that in the UK, if men were sentenced as leniently as women, five out of six men in British prisons would not be there, uh, and they're and they're closing women's prisons and building more men's prisons. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's quite obscene. Um, it I'm, is obscene. It I'm, is obscene, and and you know, and the, the fact is, of course, that I mean, I have sympathy with the idea of. Um, perhaps um, making it possible for people to avoid going to prison for certain types of crimes with certain mitigating circumstances. I think many people um, would be open to discussions about that. But men too, most of the men in prison grew up in horrible, abusive situations. Most of them were inducted into their life of crime mm. by a partner. Many of them f felt they had very few choices in life. Many of them were victims of abuse by their mothers, the very same mothers that were always told should be kept out of prison so that they can mother their children. You know, I mean, the, yes. yeah, the, the, the refusal to see female evil, I think it, it must be almost unprecedented. You know, when we talk about these things, people will often say, well, societies just are gynocentric you know that's that's the way it is there is a biological 
utility in valuing females over males. Mm. And I, yes, okay, if you look back through all societies, not that I'm an expert in, in you know, world history or anything, but yes, you can, you can perhaps make that argument. But I think all former societies, civilizations, let's say, had a stake in discerning female evil, forms of female evil, and working out structures, whether institutional or societal, to control it. Of course, we have always been interested in discerning and controlling male evil, and we know what it looks like and the forms it takes. At this point now, it seems to me that we, we actually refuse to admit that there is such a thing as female evil. And, and, and that denial just gets worse with every passing year, doesn't it? Okay, yeah. th th that brings me on to the next question, uh, <laughs> Janice. Um, uh, now, now, Elizabeth's question was about um, about religion and feminists. I'd just like to make the point about feminists who, who counter the point that major religions were founded by men by portraying witchcraft as a religion which was created by women and then suppressed by men. Now, of course, witchcraft is a creed seeking to use evil to destroy people for the personal advantaging of women. So just like feminism, then, I think. I mean, the, the, the parallel is pretty, pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. I mean, now, of course, we have various um, movements in our society that are paganistic in origin, that relate to the idea of goddess religion, you know, that supposedly value the particular connections between women and the earth, and that found the idea of, again, of women's greater moral superiority, greater significance, you know, greater importance to the, to the world. Uh, through that connection to the earth imply that men are stayed outright that men are the ones that destroy the earth that all male activities are a form of rape I mean, there's actually a whole area of eco critical feminist um, Environmentalist theory that makes draws straight lines between the rape of women and the supposed rape of the earth through mining and you know all resource extraction activities and and the building of industry and all that sort of thing so so, you know, versions of uh, Wicca and goddess religion, I think, have perhaps never been stronger or certainly very strong right now. And the animus towards men remains a deep part of that orientation. Yeah. OK. So, so my, my question, uh, you recently wrote in a private email to Elizabeth and myself about the feminist corruption of academia. Uh, thank you for your agreement that, that, that we read out an extract. It's, it's quite lengthy, but I'm sure our viewers will appreciate it. You wrote this. I am deeply concerned about the corruption of academia and all the knock-on effects of that, particularly as it has affected what we know about the world. Every time I look at a feminist so-called study of something, I'm overwhelmed by the number of citations to other feminist studies, many of them pu published in feminist journals, though many also, uh, also published in once real academic journals, which have been colonized by feminists. The industry of feminists making irrational, untested and unfal unfalsifiable claims around the world, and then, and then being cited and recited by other feminists until the claims take on the status of unchallenged do dogma is both absurd and frightening. Most people don't have time to look into the web of poor research most people think that if something is published in an academic journal, it must have some validity, not realizing how thoroughly feminists have taken over all knowledge production in academia. Yeah. Even those who are not feminists cannot challenge this monopoly but precisely because it is one. And their positions will be in jeopardy if they challenge it because they'll never be published again or invited to a conference or invited to participate in a research project. I was struck this again when looking into Deborah Parkinson's so-called study on violence against women following the Australian bushfires. A woman's belief, backed by no research at all, has become a nationally accepted truth with untold consequences for public perception and public policy. Um, and end of uh, quotation from your, from your email. J Janice, you paint a, a bleak picture of the feminist corruption of academia. Is there an appetite among academics to challenge it? And if so, how might that manifest itself? Mm. Well, there is an appetite amongst a very small minority of academics who are very aware that if they wish to continue in their careers, many of them, you know, loving doing the work that they do, the research, having the opportunity to do it, 
uh, to be paid for doing research and reading books and exploring ideas and doing studies and they love teaching as well they know that if they step out of line at the very least their lives will become far less pleasant than they are I've done many videos about um, individual academics who said the wrong thing or pursued the wrong line of questioning or study and found themselves pariahs amongst their colleagues and were just mercilessly persecuted. And immediately, of course, the, the easiest kinds of allegations come out against these people. Well, if it's a man in particular, he has created a hostile environment for women and other marginalized students. And so he's going to find himself in huge trouble. Allegations are going to emerge almost immediately that he has engaged in improper behavior, sexual misconduct, at the very least sexual harassment, that he's said horrible things about women and trans people and gay people, etc. Uh, if it's a woman, it's a little bit more difficult for that kind of attack to take place, but it takes place anyway. A uh, woman that I profiled about a year ago now named Rachel Fulton Brown, an esteemed medievalist at the University of Chicago, one of the few universities that actually has a statement of academic freedom, but still found herself attacked because she dared to write a little blog post called Three Cheers for White Men. She's been called a racist. Uh, she's been you know, accused of persecuting a younger woman of color scholar, and you know, she's been denounced by everybody. So these are the kinds of challenges that anybody seeking to dissent from ap academic orthodoxy is going to face. So it's very, very difficult. And the problem is that the majority, well, the, I would say, I don't know, you know about the majority. Certainly um, studies of professors' political affiliations show that they lean heavily left mm. and they're getting more hard left with every year. They, like all leftists, are not interested in debate or a wide spectrum of opinion. So when they hire, they, do, they never hire a conservative or a non-leftist if they can possibly help it. So that means that the numbers of people who are on the hard left or at least are willing to be quiet about their opinions and support positions of the hard left grows every year. And, um, you know, these are people who long ago gave up on the idea that academia was supposed to be a place for the uh, disinterested pursuit of knowledge. That idea started to go out in the 60s and 70s. Alan Bloom has a wonderful book called The Closing of the American Mind, where he talks about seeing it happening. It went into overdrive in the late 80s and 90s, and it is now, you know, it has completed its revolution. So they gave up on the idea that academia was a place where you would withdraw from the hurly-burly of politics and ideological wrangling to consider topics in a disinterested manner. Uh, Bloom quotes Socrates saying that, you know, it's better to know justice, you know, to really understand what justice is than to try to impl uh, implement whatever partial version of it is roiling the public imagination of the time. Well, academics have totally rejected that. They believe that they're primary goal is to implement justice, social justice in this case. Many of them were hired now as part of this movement to make academia more representative of the wider society. So they were hired partly because they are queer and do queer studies or because they are feminists and they talk about women's experience. So they don't want anything to change. This has become their entire life this is their career and it's a very very nice career uh you know it's it's easy work pleasant uh and very very well paid and secure they don't want anything to change and they will fight tooth and nail with anybody who says it should um and of course all of those accusations if you dissent from that idea that the primary purpose of academia is to bring about the revolution to create foot soldiers out of your students, to teach, you know, to make them woke so that they too will go out into the world and they do go out into the world. They will become journalists. They will become uh, public school teachers. They will become lawyers. They will become social workers. 
you know, they will go into all these spheres of society to become police officers who implement the vision of social justice that they were taught, in which white men are the enemy and have oppressed everybody else for centuries and deserve to be held back in turn until we achieve this utopia that they've been told is possible. So, um, you know, there are just too many of those people and they are far too aggressive for, I think, any attempt at reform to make any headway. So I'm, I mean, to say I'm pessimistic, <laughs> this is an understatement. I, I mean, I really do, I honestly believe that reform at this point is impossible. There isn't enough interest in it and the strategies that its opponents will use are far too effective. Um, you know, so uh, I think academia will have to be destroyed and rebuilt from the ground up. And I have no idea how that's going to happen. I mean, one of the few good things that might come out of the COVID-19 crisis is that we, we can see that much of academic study can take place over the internet. And, you know, perhaps we start using that to create private universities that uh, can leave all of this ideological nonsense and bullying behind. I think I think you used the term feminist theory earlier on, Janice. Whenever, yeah. whenever I hear that term, I think of, the, you know, you know, a tooth fairy theory or fairies yeah. at the bottom of the garden theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is nothing in feminism that stacks up. Literally nothing. Literally nothing. Yes, I, I agree. You know, and, and when it started back in the early 1970s, when they began opening programs and then whole departments in what was then usually called women's studies, and it became gender studies. Now it's sometimes gender sexuality and so, something else, resistance studies, things like that. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I just, I, a lot of people, I think, had their doubts they could see that this was, it was just theory. It had no basis in reality, but they thought, well, that's interesting, you know, and some of the things feminists have to say occasionally, in those days anyway, were interesting. And I think no one imagined that it would become the orthodoxy from which one could not dissent, but it did. And that's okay. a I, terrifying I, thing. Sorry, sorry to drop you there, Josh. Um, okay, I think that brings us to our third, our third question, um, Elizabeth. Okay, well, a bit of a change of subject, but I talk a lot with Peter Wright, and he published fairly recently a really great article called Mythologies of the Men's Rights and Feminist Movements, in which he talks about how intrinsic stories are to our perceptions and lives, and how dominant mythologies inevitably give way to emergent mythologies. Uh, he defines the mythology that underpins feminism and suggests that facts be damned. Mm -hmm. The men's rights movement needs to develop and articulate stories that can compete with feminism's hold over the collective imaginations of our societies. So when Paul Elam joined us on Gender Matters recently, we discussed personal mythologies, which are critically important, but I'm also interested in stories about our collective past and present, and genuinely convinced that within this idea lies a great opportunity to affect positive change. And I'm also convinced that that work will be a singular pleasure because while facts be damned, I think we can and should try to reflect reality more accurately than feminism. And that mm -hmm. the reality of our collective past and present is so much more beautiful than the feminist faithful let on. So the truth as I see it is that history is a collection of stories about men and women working together to progress. Uh, as a professor or a former professor of English, you're obviously a story person too. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the idea of building a new mythology, uh, if you think there's utility in the idea, and what you think the story should look like. Mm, that's a great question too. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that's a, it's a big topic. It's, it's a difficult one because uh, the story of the damsel in distress it has always been a very compelling one, and it is now essentially, I'd say, the dominant story. 
And uh, the story that um, we in the men's movement sometimes oppose to that is the man in distress. And certainly there is a great deal of reality in the fact that many men in our societies are suffering terrible injustices. And it's very dispiriting, I, I find, that both men and women don't tend to find that story particularly compelling. And uh, so partly what I think is that the story that we oppose to the feminist narrative of the suffering woman is not going to be the suffering man, even though that is a, a reality. It's, um, you know, and I do agree with you, Elizabeth, that the reality of our past is the reality of men doing wonderful things with women and for women to create civilizations that could be places where women and children could flourish. That's simply the, the fact of the matter. And it's a tragic story in a beautiful way because it involved untold male sacrifice made out of love for women and children, which we now, you know, feminists completely deny. Of course, the reality of that sacrifice goes on. It is the reality of everyday life. If you put into Google, man dies saving, and then just leave it, all sorts of stories come up about men sacrificing, sacrificing their lives for complete strangers diving into, you know, rip currents in, in the ocean to save a child, somebody else's child. Women do tremendous things sometimes for their own children, but they don't tend to sacrifice their lives for complete strangers in the way that men do. Um, men still die doing the most difficult, dirty, dangerous, horrific work in the world by the thousands, and that is something that is not commemorated. Uh, I was thinking, as I was thinking about our interview, tomorrow is April 16th. April 16th should be a day that we commemorate all across the Western world. It was the day on which the Titanic sank in 1912. And there we see a stark illustration of what patriarchy meant in terms of men's lives and women's lives. You were far more likely to survive in a lifeboat as a woman in the third class than as a man in first class. So we all agree that British society was divided by class, but we don't agree that British society was all about the adulation and protection of women. We imagine it was about the oppression of women. And yet it's a funny kind of patriarchal oppression, isn't it, that wants to save women. And uh, I think women accounted for, or, or I think it was about 80% of women or 75 percent of women perhaps survived the the titanic sinking whereas only about 20 percent of men did so that's what patriarchy looked like and um I might, you know that i might add janice those men were demonized and though yes of course yes and those men knew that they were going home to a society that would not uh, appreciate their having survived they should they were supposed to die so yeah i mean it's that then that's tragic you know and if we want to I, I mentioned this once at a talk a very early talk i gave and immediately someone said yes well patriarchy hurts men too that's the whole point you know of feminism Femin okay yes in that sense yeah patriarchy did hurt men it certainly did. It hurt only men, we could even say, or mainly men. And okay, so, so what, are, what does feminism have to say about that? Does feminism want a world in which women die in equal numbers, in war, in killing work, and you know, in all of the ways that men still are expected to sacrifice themselves for? Let's have that honest conversation about whether equality is possible and what it would look like. Uh, and let's acknowledge all the ways that men made an inordinate contribution to the, to, to the past to make the secure, incredibly productive, technologically advanced lives that we now live possible. Let's appreciate and love and admire men for that. Men have always been the, the creators, the inventors, the protectors, the providers, also the warriors, mm -hmm. the ones who died so that others could live. 
Uh, they were the authority figures and they had earned that authority. And we've talked already about what unearned authority and unearned power and unearned moral superiority looks like in, in our modern society. What were women's roles in the past? Well, we know women's roles were as caretakers and nurturers and sexual companions and, and healers and sometimes scribes and, and prophets and, and knowledge makers as well. Um, but now we, we ha have a society where, I mean, at least in the past, men, I think, always had the raw deal. But at least in the past, there was some sort of reciprocity and mutual recognition of the roles that each sex played in creating civilization. Now we're supposed to, you know, recognize everything that women do. Women are no longer to be confined to any role based on sex. They are to be, you know, uh, could, um, helped, aided, uh, suckered as they enter any particular male sphere. And uh, they're to be applauded for that and appreciated for that. And most men are really happy to do it. And yet all of the contributions that men have made in the past and present uh, are not recognized at all. So um, mutual recognition and uh, some sort of reciprocity and some sort of honest discussion of what our gender order should look like would be really, really useful. And yes, telling stories about what men have always done, male heroism, uh, is and you know there simply is no equivalent version of female heroism and until we face that there's no way we can go forward in any kind of healthy manner. There, there, there is of course um, well certainly on the BBC and I'm sure the same will be true of ABC and CBC there's um, there's some series on at the moment where sort of young women are portrayed as sort of frontline soldiers of course they're very brave Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and so on. it's just it's just complete fiction i remember it's complete fiction a, a yeah. documentary in, in afghanistan where some woman a soldier um was basically driven around the various compounds where the woman and ch women and children sort of, you know spent their days and um and you know while while, while their, their their partners and brothers and 10 year old sons were out in the fields with kalashnikovs you know trying to save trying trying to protect them and this woman was actually um proud of how she'd, she, she, she'd gone around these compounds to, to teach Af Afghani, Afghani women about the patriarchy. Yeah. Um, and so, so the men driving her around were, were risking their lives for this incredible... So uh, she could attempt to undermine their society. Well, you know, plus, yeah. I'm sure she, she was paid the same, but she was actually asked yeah. what, what, what happens if, you know, in the event of a, a firefight with a Taliban. And she laughed and said, I, 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 said, I hit the floor and I let the boys sort it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So and that, and that paid, same as these guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and literally doing nothing in the way of soldiering. Yeah. I mean, this is this is a real problem. It's a whole other discussion at women in the military. You know, we, we now we are at the point where we actually create fictions. Yes. And and sell them to everybody, including it seems the women themselves. But you know, the cognitive dissonance must be massive. They know that they cannot do the work. The standards have been lowered in the military to get women in. Women are not interested in frontline soldiering. They're not interested in the combat positions. Even now, I think the percentage of women in the US military is something like 2% in, like in, in military combat positions. Uh, in Canada, it's even less than that. Uh, and the problems that are created for men of having to cover for the women, women simply do not have, I mean, it's not the women's fault. And this is not to take away from those women who do want to serve their country. I admire those women a great deal. But women don't have the physical capacity. It's not clear they have the emotional and psychological capacity to withstand the stress of battle either. And it endangers men's lives and weakens the fighting force of the military for for us to pretend that they do and yet we yes. go on yes so, so, so you know you know on, on long marches or whatever yes um you know the the, the women will not carry the set they the can't men, do it the men have to carry more equipment mm -hmm. because the women can't do it it's um yeah. it's, it's absolutely insane but uh, it's absolutely insane it's absolutely insane and so you know to go back to that idea of the stories that we're telling like we've now gone into the realm of you know utter 
destructive fantasy. And yes, every, every movie you watch practically, it's all about women soldiers, you know, women leaders, women saving their societies, and women's courage, women's physical strength, etc. It's all a lie. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, th th this, in case, in case you're wondering, Janice, this is the, this is the badge for for the ninth, for the 2020 International Conference on Men's Issues. Looks good. Which, mm -hmm. which Elizabeth and I are, are working on, and we're hoping to announce that in in two or three weeks' time. Um, and my my my, my draft uh, talk title will be "Pandering to Women's Narcissism uh, yeah. is Destroying Society," and mm -hmm. that's the military is really quite an uh, it, an elegant and nuanced uh, example it, of that. It sure is, yeah. And and you know, and the ultimate thing is that it is not making women much happier. No. Every survey you look at, every study says that women's happiness is actually declining. I looked in detail at a 2008 study, so it's sort of old now, but I think its findings are still relevant. And it said that in every decade after 1970, women's sense of life satisfaction is going down, even though by all measures, you know, they have greater economic power, more choices in the workplace, all of that, more certainly more freedoms. Uh, yet somehow, you know, having the freedom to abort your unwanted child, having the freedom to get rid of the husband that you're not interested anymore, but still live off his earnings, having the freedom to act like a slut and get applauded for it by your society. <laughs> I mean, of course, I'm putting it in the worst possible terms, but you know, and, and having the freedom to, you know, crawl up the corporate ladder, that these things do not seem to be making women happier. And why is that? Well, um, you know, there's nobody knows exactly, but I think it does have, it circles back to that first discussion about uh, moral superiority. If you are not, if you don't have a conception of what it means to be a good person. And men have always had that, and they still do. Everybody knows what a good man is. A good man is somebody who provides for his family. He's somebody who battles for the good. He protects the weak. He defeats evil. I mean, that's, that's it. What is a good woman, according to a feminist? If you ask a feminist that, she, she'll just laugh. You know, they see that as a relic of the patriarchy, this notion of goodness in, in a woman, she'll laugh and say a good woman is somebody who, who, you know, battles against the patriarchy. So she gives women an empty identity based on anger. Mm. And all the traditional virtues of women, like humility and loving kindness and, and nurturing and prudence and fortitude modesty. and the, the restraint of one modesty the restraint of one's emotions you know all those kinds of things that jane austen talked about over 200 years ago in her novels all of those have now been poo-pooed but actually they are foundational to a woman having a healthy identity and so this is one of the things that feminism has done for women has made them increasingly unhappy and angry okay. Well, that brings me to the final question, Janice. Um, I'd like to raise the issue uh, of women in the men's rights movement. I think they've been, women have been absolutely pivotal in the modern movement, particularly over the last decade. And over time, there'll be ever more of them. At the International Conference on Men's Issues, which we hosted in London in 2018, Karen Strawn gave the keynote speech titled, Women Must Consign Feminism to the Dustbin of History. In the Q&A, she was asked what it would take for more women to reject feminism, and her answer was that it would have to become cool for them to reject it. <laughs> I inwardly groaned at the time, but, but with hindsight, I think she had a point. And um, against my expectations, perhaps, anti-feminism is becoming cool among women, in large part because women find so much to admire in female anti-feminists and little, if anything, to admire in female feminists. What do you see as the future for attracting more women into the movement and persuading more women to reject feminism, both privately and publicly? <laughs> yeah, that's the question, isn't it? Uh, well, I guess in a way I go back to what I just said, that I hope that women will come to see that a sane society, a society that actually values uh, individual merit, for example, which seems to have fallen away in you know, most of the public sphere, uh, a society that recognizes the sources of both male and female greatness and the sources of male and female weakness, 
you know, with honesty and integrity, that that is a society that's better for women. <laughs> I think it'll have to be, there'll have to be an element of self-preservation in women's recognition that feminism doesn't do anything good for anybody, including for women and children, uh, and that will make them gravitate towards the, the anti-feminist, the men's issues movement. I hope that movement will continue uh, to be primarily led by men. I don't think it would be a good thing if the, if the movement were, were led by, by women, but I hope a healthy dose of women will come in in, in uh, strong supporting roles. Uh, to help men articulate, um, you know, their, their issues. And, and yeah, what, I mean, it's, it's a simple enough thing as Tom Golden has often says, we, we should love and admire men because men are worthy of being loved and admired. And I think, and that is a very attractive thing. So I hope that uh, more and more people will be compelled by it. Okay. Th thank you, Janice. Uh, Elizabeth, do you have anything more? That's all. It's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for your time, Janice. Well, thank you. I enjoyed speaking to you both and look forward to the conference. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. And thank you for agreeing to speak at it. Yeah. <laughs> Along with Tom Golden mm. and Paulie Lamb, of course, and, mm. and Elizabeth. Course. So it should be great. Mm -hmm. Janice, thank you very much indeed. Have a great week. And you. Bye now. Bye-bye. Take care.